Welcome, everyone. We're going to talk today about something that you'd think we all would know about by now, yet relationships can be one of the most gratifying areas of our lives, but they can also be the dangus levels of our lives. That's the nice word. <clears throat> so anyway, we're going to talk about what, it, what is a healthy relationship. So before we, so there are a few people just getting their food, so uh, what, what does make for a healthy relationship? How would you know you had a rel- healthy relationship if you were in one? I think that person helps me, um, brings out the best in me. Brings out the best in you. Yeah, that's a healthy relationship. Okay. Yeah. Mutually supportive. Mutually supportive, mutually beneficial. Good boundaries. Good boundaries. Yes. Respect. Honesty. There's a respect there. Honesty. Honesty. Yeah, you can... You can tell the truth to this to this other person. Good, very good. So we're going to explore that a little further. <clears throat> and I'm just going to start out with this quote that life is nothing without friendship. So here's the second audience participation question. What's the difference between a friendship and a relationship? You can choose a friendship, but a relationship... Very often, you don't have any choices. Have you looked ahead in my <laughs> talk? Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> That's exactly right. No, very often, re- many relationships we have are not chosen, but, but for one of the hallmarks of a friendship is that we have chosen that friendship. Or if, we, if it's not a friendship any longer, we can choose to get out of it. But many relationships we are stuck in, and it changes the whole dynamic of the relationship. That's very good. Thank you. So let's look at these common relationships that we all, well, not everyone, we don't all have these, but uh, most of us have friends, uh, and that's, that's always a choice. Sometimes you think you're stuck in a friendship, but in reality, it's, it's a choice. Uh, husband, wife, that's initially a choice, and for the most part, it's a choice. I guess you could say it's always a choice, but many people can kind of, kind of start to feel stuck there. Uh, I always say it's wise to choose your parents well, uh, but that's not always a choice, uh, not a choice actually. Uh, the teacher-student, I mean sometimes we get to choose our teachers or, our, or as teachers we, we really don't get to choose our students. My wife's a teacher and sometimes she wishes she could choose her students uh, from what she hears from the earlier grades. Uh, the bo- boss-employee, it's not much of a choice either, you can always quit. But very often you need the job, you need the work. Um, uh, it reminds me of a, of a Woody Allen joke where uh, the, 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 the husband, I get, you can tell it both ways, you can tell it from the husband's perspective or the wife's perspective, but the husband's in and he's talking to the psychiatrist, he's having a rough time and pretty distraught and, and, and the psychiatrist says, well, how's your marriage going? And, and he says, well, my wife is kind of strange. She, she goes around the house, you know, flapping her wings and clucking and, and you know, thinks she thinks she's a chicken. And so uh, the psychiatrist says, you know, that's pretty bad. That's pretty distorted thinking. He says, so, you know, why don't you just get out of that marriage? He says, well, I would, but I need the eggs. <laughs> so <clears throat> the doctor-patient relationship. Now, we do kind of choose our doctors, but there's a lot of insurance companies now where you're more or less assigned or there's not very many doctors available and so that's always that's not always much of a choice either so this comes back to what is the difference between a friendship and a relationship is that by and large friendships are freely chosen and rarely problematic Uh, they can be whereas other relationships are often not freely chosen and are commonly problematic. I mean, you know, if we really think about it, a big part of what causes stress in our lives is problematic relationships. Friends are God's apology for relations. (laughs) One loyal friend is worth 10,000 relatives. So why do friends seem to be so much better than relatives and relationships or relations? You choose, yeah, the choice factor. And so we'll just, uh, we, without going any further, I'll just ask the, the next question. Are friendships the healthiest of all relationships? 
So I would say I've, I value my friends very highly, and I've lost a number of friends that not, through death and illness and whatnot, and so it's always a tremendous loss. Pro, not that family members aren't, but there's something special about friendships. And, French, and even within family relationships, you'll have closer relationships where you'll say, hey, I'm friends with, I have a cousin that I think of as a really close friend, even though she is a blood relative. So this, uh, this quote, good friends are good for your health. So that's going to be the theme of my presentation today is that if you can cultivate friendship-like relationships, uh, you are going to improve your health. And so uh, what makes for healthy relationships and what are the, uh, why are healthy relationships good for our health? What is it about a healthy relationship that improves our health? And so what makes for good, healthy relationships? I'm going to borrow these. Uh, this is from D Dr. William Glasser, who uh, m some of you may have heard of him. Um, he's, a, uh, he's a psychiatrist, but he, he works in the field of reality therapy. And I'm going to talk more about him later on in the presentation. But he says the seven caring habits that help you cultivate healthy relationships are listening, supporting, uh, encouraging, respecting, you know, the boundary issue, trusting, uh, accepting. You know, that's one of the interesting things about a really good friend is that they accept you for who you are. And always being willing to uh, negotiate disagreements, because disagreements can ar arise, but that doesn't mean you have to be disagreeable. The seven deadly habits, and you can just review some of the people that you know you either cringe when you think about them, or there's a, some kind of a, a relationship struggle going on. Very often you'll find these habits at work, criticizing, blaming, complaining, nagging, threatening, punishing, or bribing. Uh, or rewarding in order to control. That's what we call bribing. So how do these, how do these uh, play out? And, and so do unhealthy relationships actually make us sick? And there's someone's phone. So Dr. Jack Medley, he did a study on this, and he found that men in relationships where they felt loved were partially protected from heart disease. I mean, it's... it's uh, you know, you often hear about someone dying of a broken heart, and oftentimes it is a heart attack. So we do know there is a relationship between dysfunctional relationships and disease. And this was one study. Men in unloving relationships were more likely to develop anginal heart pain. Men live longer when married. But that's not true for women. I always thought that was interesting, the reverse. Men who grew up feeling a high level of criticism were more likely to engage in negative health behaviors, such as smoking, uh, weight gain, and poor exercise. So that was an interesting little study. In JAMA, uh, back in 97, they did a study of adolescents, protecting adolescents from harm, uh, this National Longitudinal Study on Adolescent Health. Most significantly, parent-family connectedness and perceived school connectedness were protective of every health risk behavior measure except history of pregnancy. So what I want to talk about now is this concept of connectedness. What is it that makes for this feeling of connectedness in relationships, whether it's a relationship with a, a family member or a teacher? You know, all of us, I'm sure, had mentors in our life, teachers that we connected with who literally maybe were a, were a, a huge uh, transition for us from maybe not being interested in school to being interested in school or not knowing where you're going with your education to helping you kind of identify what were the life goals that you have pursued. And so connectedness, I think, is very important. Does connectedness equate with happiness? I mean, obviously, when you see two lovebirds together, they look pretty happy. They are pretty highly connected. How do we cultivate connectedness in the important relationships of our lives? To me, this is a highly important question because this is, I, I, we, my wife and I used to teach a marriage seminar where we talked about how we think we live in houses and go to work in office buildings. But in reality, we live in relationships and we live in work relationships and family relationships and some friend relationships. These are the things that really give us the uh, meaning and uh, 
purpose in our lives. So this was Glasser's key question. How can I figure out how to be free to live my life the way I want to live it and still get along well with the people I need? Because there's a kind of a dynamic here in terms of freedom and you know relationships you know this whole thing about relationships tying you down and certain relationships being a burden but how do we resolve some of that tension that naturally seems to come about in key relationships so just to talk a little bit about William Glasser because I think he was a he's I think he's still alive he's a pretty smart guy that's written many books <coughs> to me the book if you want to read his kind of like the the book that he he, he wrote several books about schools and uh, relationships and whatnot, but the one that kind of ties it all together is the book entitled Choice Theory. So it's a model, it's a working model. I'm going to show you a, a pictorial version of it because it, he took a whole book to explain it, but I'm going to show you it in a picture. And it really is all about how to cultivate healthy relationships. He, as a psychiatrist, he did not prescribe drugs. He was one of the old-fashioned talk psychiatrists that we, it's hard to find these days. But he, uh, when people would come in distraught with some kind of you know, depression or whatever the mental illness was that they were trying to deal with, he would always be looking for what was the relationship that was the burr under the saddle. What was, what was bringing about the problems in their life that was creating, uh, the, the relationship that was creating the problems in their health or in their life. He, was, he felt it was that important. And he, he feels like you can apply this choice theory to all of, of the important relationships in your life. And to me, one of the best things you can do is become better at relationships. If you can do relationships well, you're, you're going to have a, a better quality life. So the choice theory model has uh, four components to it. it. It has this idea of what we call the basic needs that he says have a genetic basis in our, in our behavior, and different people have different strengths of need. Some people need more love and belonging. Some people need more freedom. We'll, we'll go into that in just a minute. He, he invented this term called the quality world. These are, these are pictures that we carry within us of things that we really like, what really satisfied our needs. And we, we're always striving to achieve those pictures, like the little girl who has the picture of growing up one day to meet Prince Charming and I mean, a lot of the fairy tales really have a lot to do with these ideal behavioral pictures that we carry around in our minds. Total behaviors, is, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. It's a holistic behavior system. And then what he calls the creative system, because inevitably we run into conflicts in our lives, and especially in relationships. And so this system exists, he thought, as a way of helping us resolve conflict in our lives. So I'll explain this a little bit more as we go along. This is kind of like an overview or a working model of choice theory. And it's got, and we'll go into the different parts, but these are the, the basic needs over here. And there are pictures that you've developed that have helped you satisfy your basic needs. I always, when, one time my roommate in college invited me to his home up on Great Spirit Lake. And, it, and I had never sailed before. And he took me out on his, like it was like a 16 foot sailboat. And he says, okay, I'm gonna let you steer it. And we were hiking out, and it was the sun was setting, and it was a beautiful sunset. The, the, the waves were flash, splashing up on us. It was just great to be alive, and I never have been able to replicate that since then. And I'm sure you can think of times like that where you've had this wonderful experience, and you keep looking, how can I get back to that again? And it's not always easy once you've achieved a, a really ideal picture of some kind of need-satisfying event in your life. And so we're always comparing what's going on in our mind with, with the real world and what, how we perceive what's happening to us in the world, real world. And when those don't match up and we experience stress, that's where we become creative and start choosing different behaviors in order to try to get the, the world to match up with our ideal pictures. But I'll, I'll explain a little bit more of that later. Here's the real world. Here's the quality world that we all dream about, literally. And then these are the behaviors that, that we choose in an effort to try to match up the real world with our quality world. That, this is uh, Glasser's model, by the way. So he basically says there's uh, two ways of, of uh, getting along, or you can phrase that another way, why do we choose to behave the way we do with other people? Well, one way is what he calls external control psychology. And there's many, many examples of this. And then there's choice theory. And we'll, this, this is really what the, uh, thesis of this presentation is, I'm just, just to state it very simply, is that 
more often than not, the, the uh, pain and suffering that we experience in relationships comes from this, uh, this attempt to control others, external control. And we do it unconsciously, and I'll, and I'll, sh I'll show you how it happens. So this is, these are some of the uh, attitudes that go along with external control psychology. I am not responsible for the way I feel. My boss made me feel bad today, or, or that, that student that acted up, that's why I'm having a bad day. Or, uh, that's, so, there's, so there's something external to you is the reason why you feel bad. Other people, unhappy events, or abnormal brain chemistry cause my pain. And it's very popular these days to look at the notion that it, you know, it's just a matter of brain chemistry being out of whack, otherwise we'd be happy. And so if we just take the right pills, we're going to be happy again. We'll just get those neurotransmitters all adjusted and everything will be fine. My choices are not the cause of my misery. A lot of the external control psychology is a running away from responsibility for the choices that you're making that's generating unhappiness and suffering in your life. To feel better, I will punish the people who are doing wrong so that they will do what I say is right, and then I'll reward them so they'll keep doing what I want them to do. So it's a lot of if, if just other people behaved in the way that I thought they should behave, then I would be happy. This is external control psychology. External control in relationships. It's not me to blame, it's my, and you fill in the blank of whoever it is that's a problem relationship in your life. Husband or wife, parent or child, teacher, student, and you know, most of us have probably been on both sides of these equations, not, no, obviously not husband, well, spouse is both sides, but parent, child, teacher, student, boss, employee, doctor, patient. So to be happy, I must change the way that this problem person behaves. If they would just do what I thought they should do, then I would be okay. They're the cause of my problem. And so one way or another, I'm going to try to control them in, in such a way that they will now start behaving correctly so that then I can feel better. Unfortunately, I think that's an ineffective assumption. You can spend a lot of time trying to change other people. How many of you have been in a marriage very long and you tried to change your spouse? How much did they really change, you know? It's an ineffective assumption, yet we do it all the time because it's, it's just in our whole culture that somehow we have to change people for the better and then we'll be happy. And how we try to do that, though, more often than not, is through these seven deadly habits. We criticize our spouse or our patient. We blame them for how we're feeling. We complain about how we're, how, uh, what they're doing. We nag them. We threaten them. We punish them. This sounds like, this sounds like school, doesn't it? Um, of course, I hear about this a lot because my wife's a second grade teacher. Uh, <clears throat> we bribe them, you know, with kids. We do that, but we do that in the real, in the work world. You know, if we give people a raise in order to get this done or whatever. So these can be very ineffective behaviors, and yet we use them all the time. And, and the, a lot of people say, why do we do this? Why, if they are ineffective, if we do have a sense that they really don't work all that well to change the other people that, are, that we're in relationship with, why do we do it? Well, they work short term. They, they do have, like if you, if you hold a gun to someone's head and ask them to, to change, they'll, they'll, they, they'll change as long as you've got the gun to their head. But it's not really... A true change. Uh, it's like the old Jack. Y'all you you all know who Jack Benny was? How many? How old is his audience? <laughs> yeah, you remember the story where he's walking down the street and a guy comes up to him up with a mask on and a gun and says, points it at his head and says, "Your money or your life?" And he he doesn't move and he says, "Your money or your life?" And Jack Benny says, "I'm thinking." <laughs> you know what are what are your priorities? So stereotypic behaviors, 99% of humankind chooses these behaviors over and over again. Rarely do we stop to think how much misery these behaviors cause us. Because in the heat of the moment, this is what we fall back on because very often this is how we were raised. Uh, parenting is a lot of uh, external control. And some of that obviously you need you know, for the safety of your child, but, but you know, sometimes you lose the relationship in the process. This psychology of coercion destroys happiness, health, marriages, families, and quality work. People will do the work if you hold a gun to their head, one way or, you know, uh, symbolically, but it won't necessarily be the highest quality. 
And Glasser feels that it is often the root cause of violence, crime, drug abuse, illness, and unloving sex so pervasive in our society. We did have, we had a whole uh, book club here uh, a couple years ago on, uh, there was a doctor up in Canada who looked at the origins of many chronic illnesses and found that there was very definitely a relationship between uh, chronic illness and uh, stress and, and family disruption and life disruption. So, we, and I think most of us know that that's true. So here's my little bit of wisdom. Uh, the smart bird does not poop in its own nest, which means that very often we're most likely to criticize, to threaten, to bribe, to do all these deadly habits with the people we're closest to. Why do we do that? Uh, well, we, we, we think that we want to control them. Not that we don't think that. We, we just feel like that's the way you make the relationship better, is through coercion. And uh, there may be a better way. So here's some of the choice theory precepts on that whole issue. If you take the position that I'm the only person that I can really control, the only person I can control is really just myself. And we found this in our relationship training, marriage relationship training, instead of trying to get the other person to change, what can I do to improve the relationship? Always kind of taking some ownership in that, in that, uh, in that dynamic. The other person almost always changes as I stop trying to externally control them. This is really interesting. If you're having a problem relationship, try stop, stop stopping whatever you're doing to, to control that person and just listen. Do some of the, the listen, be with them, do some things together. Uh, and it's interesting how that will bring about a change. You know, first of all, it will floor the other person if you're normally a co coercive type person. But if you start just being with them and just paying attention. Glasser found that out. Uh, he, he wrote a book on uh, schools without failure and he found that more often than not the students that were having trouble had broken down relationships with teachers or broken down student-student relationships and, and a lot of times if he would just have them come in and listen and start to form a relationship with them without judging them, without threatening to f give them a flunking grade, but just listening and developing that relationship their whole dynamic began to change. And maybe some of you in your own lives, a lot, a lot of movies are about this very thing, that when suddenly you start to accept the other person instead, instead of trying to manipulate them, all of a sudden they, they start growing. They start changing for the better. And so you ask yourself the question, what can I do to help my whoever it is satisfy his or her basic needs? Because often that's what's going on is that there's a struggle that, that other person in the relationship does not feel free or they do not feel loved or they're not having any fun. And so what can you do to help satisfy some of the basic needs? And so these seven caring habits, turns out, are very need satisfying to human beings. When you have someone who will listen to you, you feel empowered. When you are supported, you feel love and belonging. When you are encouraged, you're more likely to try something new or try to work things out. If you're respected, and you're respecting them, then a lot of good things can happen. Nothing good happens in a relationship without trust. Trust is the basis of all really good relationships. And if you accept the other person, that's when growth can start to occur. And when you do have an agreement, a disagreement, it's not, it's not bad, but the power of negotiation is, is sometimes overlooked in, in these uh, important relationships. So these are behaviors that help cultivate healthy relationships. And, all of us have the, according to Glasser, now you can challenge, all, all of this is challengeable, but uh, the five basic needs we have, we want to survive. We have basic health needs that we have to have to survive. But love and belonging is really big. Power is a very important need. Now, most people don't like to admit that they have a need for power, but we do. We like for people to listen to what we have to say. We, we want to feel empowered and are able to do things where other people uh, pay attention. Freedom is, is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like the whole foundation of our country. And the one that's overlooked a lot is fun. You know, fun is a basic need. If you're not having any fun, it's, that relationship is not going to be as healthy as it could be. So I'm going to just take a minute and go through these basic needs. But these, it, it, back to Glasser's model, I call the, uh, the old brain needs survival, like food, uh, exercise, rest, uh, a healthy environment. These are old brain needs, taking care of the body. But the new brain needs are pretty, are, they're not just true to humans, but they're 
they're, they definitely are part of who we are. We, we need to be loved. We need to have a sense of empowerment and uh, we need to uh, feel free and, and have some fun. Those are, those are basic needs. And so I was going to just kind of go through those quickly. What are, so my comment here is basic needs are to people what nutrients are to cells. And so if you're getting your basic needs met, you're going to be overall healthier and happier. And you're going to have healthier relationships. So friendship is a plant we must often water. You know, if you, if you don't ever see your friend, if you never have any interaction with this person who's your friend, the friendship can survive, yeah. but it'll obviously survive better if you're doing things together. So to keep a living being alive, what must you do? Satisfy its basic needs. Feed it, and it thrives. Starve it, and it withers. Poison it, and it dies. So relationships in my books are something that's alive. It's almost like you're creating something in between the two of you that's a kind of living thing, entity, and you have to take care of it. And if you don't, it can definitely wither away or it can become dysfunctional. We all know that. So feed the relationship, it thrives. Feed it poorly, it gets sick. Feed it well, it gets well. Starve the relationship and it begins to wither. Poison the relationship and it will eventually die. So let's go through these basic needs. So it's interesting that survival in our time isn't so much about physical survival. Uh, quality of survival is influenced because most of us are going to survive. I mean, there, there are a few people that will become, you know, have no shelter, no food, and they'll die out on the street. But for the most part, we don't, that doesn't happen a lot, I don't think, in our culture. I'm beginning to wonder. But uh, quality of survival is influenced by wellness choices like diet, exercise, rest, and relaxation. So these are the kind of quality things. And the, be the better your quality of food, the better your quality of sleep. If you get a good exercise program on a regular basis, if you know how to relax and de-stress, these are all things that improves the quality of your survival. Now, a lot of people, though, metaphorically equate survival with financial well-being and, how, and how, you're, how much money you're bringing in, how much money you're spending. Uh, and that, for a lot of people, is survival. For men, survival is often tied symbolically to sexual urge and expression. Not all men, but and some women. Uh, so that can be a, a metaphorical kind of survival. Love and belonging. I think this is the most important need because if we don't have a sense of love and belonging and we, we can't form relationships, how can we get our basic needs met? Because in general, we meet our basic needs through other relationships. So connectedness is a prerequisite for satisfying all the other basic needs. Uh, I can't make or force another one to love me. I know sometimes we'd like to, but it, you just can't. And so being in relationship is a give and take proposition. You, really, you can't really force, a, you can try, but I think that's part of the poisoning of uh, coercion. Just because I love someone does not make them love me. So that's an interesting thing about love and is that it has to be reciprocal. Power, a, unique, a need unique to human beings. You know, most animals don't need power. Now some do, but not, you know, I think there are certain primate tribes and whatnot, but in general, it's a higher mammalian type of thing. The power need is satisfied if someone listens to us with respect. If, you've, if, you've got, if you're in a relationship and the other person is really unhappy in the relationship, try listening to just what they're saying. I mean, really listening, because they feel empowered when you listen with respect. That's almost 80% of what I spend my time doing as a doctor here at the Reardon Clinic. A lot of patients have not been listened to. I try to just really listen, not just for the sake of listening, I'm listening for medical information and for ideas about what we can do to find out why they're ill, but the listening part is a very powerful thing that I think that I do that has a healing effect, and it can have a healing effect on any relationship if you just take time to listen. Nowadays, we've got a lot of ways to communicate, but they're kind of, you know, a, a text message isn't the same as sitting there and talking to someone. Or, or emails. It's just not quite the same. So we're kind of becoming all isolated in our little electronic spaces. And so I think doing things with other people can be a really good thing for a relationship. Powers having say so. Friendship is an equal power situation. 
there, there might be a little bit of a, one might be a little bit stronger than the other, but in general what makes a friendship really good is that there's a kind of an equal power. It's mutually empowering. Power can be the genetic source of external control psychology. Glasser goes into a lot about this, that uh, because, we, because human beings have such a strong need for power, we forget ourselves and start trying to control other people in order to feel empowered. Unfortunately, we disempower that person that we're trying to control, and their freedom need will kick in, and they'll resist, almost always. And so power can be very much abused, and it, it's oftentimes the reason why relationships uh, fail. So freedom is doing what I want to do. External control psychology directly challenges the need for freedom. How many of you have been in a controlling relationship and just just didn't feel good. You didn't feel, I mean, you were always being, feeling like you're being manipulated. Here's a bribe. I'll do this if you do that. So external control is not a healthy type of relationship. It's there and it's not going to go away. I find that more often than not, I can just sense it. And I think everyone senses it when someone's trying to kind of manipulate them because we, we have a very strong need to be free, especially I think Americans. I think that's the the, the gift of the American Indian. The American Indian, if you read up on anthropologically, was a very free culture in a way, and, and we Americans got that. The Europeans was very controlled, and they came over here, and we have kind of a meld between the two big psychologies. When you attempt to control others externally, expect them to resist. If you, if you start noticing yourself trying to control another person, and you, f you find that they're resisting, it's not an accident. I mean, it's, it's going to happen just about every time. Now, some people will, are, are, are very subtle in their <coughs> resistance, especially if they need the job or if they need the relationship or if you're a student and you've got a, uh, a teacher that you need the grade. You know, we, we do a lot of kind of underhanded stuff just to get through some of these, these relationships. Fun is a, is a very important need, and, I, and I, it's kind of hard to define fun, but you know it when you have it, right? So here's a question. Uh, what famous German doctor invented the hospital gown? Dr. Seymour Heine. What is the German word for constipation? Far from pooping. Just kind of joking around, but that's fun, you know, and it's kind of fun to do. And, and, and if you can have fun in a relationship, it de definitely does bring life and uh, health to the relationship. So this is all part of our quality world. We've gone through life and certain things have, you know, like there's certain foods that we'll eat that, oh my gosh, that was, that was great, or certain wines, or certain situations, dancing, certain dances, or, you know, some people hate dancing, some people love dancing, but it's whatever has satisfied your basic needs in the context of your past history, that gets stored in our brain. And when we can recreate that experience, we feel up here in control. That's we feel very satisfied and in control, and we store that. It reinforces it. Uh, there are some experiences that are just plain neutral, but if these, if these pictures don't match up and we really feel like we need these, these things, then that's when we experience stress. So a picture album stored in our memory slash imagination, you could say these are pictures of basic needs satisfied sometime in your past. And so once you have a quality picture, it's kind of hard to take that off. This, uh, take that out. That's why like drugs and certain uh, addictions are kind of bad because certain addictions create a, the illusion of satisfied need. And so you'll keep coming back to that uh, as an alternative to uh, achieving that need in a real world sort of way. It's kind of a biochemical trick to make us think that, yeah, I re I'm, now I'm really satisfied that need. So that's why drugs can be very addictive. So we each have our, we have created within the context of our life, our own unique quality world. Everyone in this room has a little bit different quality world because you all grew up having different experiences. So our quality world existed in our imagination as a picture album, kind of. This picture album contains very precise pictures. I mean, some people know exactly how much salt they want on their egg, and no more, no less. This is how much, and now my egg tastes perfect or memories that represent moments when our needs have been fulfilled in a highly satisfying way. So again, like the sailboat analogy that I gave you, certain maybe prom, you went to some prom and had a magical evening and you've been trying to recreate that ever since and it just doesn't happen. So these pictures taken together are that special world we would like to live in if we could. 
Our quality world is our ideal world, our own personal Shangri-La, where all our needs are being almost perfectly fulfilled. Every moment we are scanning the real world, comparing our outer reality with this inner, more perfect reality of our quality world. And most of the time it doesn't match up. You know, so that's why people go around feeling quite a bit of stress. So stress is when our outer perception of reality does not match our quality world picture. Stress is the difference between our inner picture and our outer perception. And a lot of times perception is colored. That's why in the model there's a kind of a lens there. And some people, their lens, they go through life with either a red lens because they're always angry, or they go through life with a green lens because they're envious of this, or they don't have enough of that. Or they go through a brown lens, which is what I call the, uh, well, I'm not going to go into that. It's the, where they have a bad image of everything. The, uh, I'm not going to say it. This dry, you know what color is brown. <clears throat> this stress drives us to behave. It's interesting. Glasser says if we didn't have stress, we might just sit in our quality world and maybe that's what meditation is, is when people go and they meditate or they pray and they just settle down and they get into a nice kind of quality world and they, they're happy. But, but you get hungry and you need other things. And so in general, though, when we're not getting our needs met, that's why we, de that's why we behave. We behave in order to alter our perception of not getting our needs met. And that was one of the hardest things when, when I first started reading William Glasser. He was quoting a book called Behavior is the Control of Perception. And what he says is that we behave in order to change our perception of how we are in the world. Why did you come to this lecture today? Maybe there was something you wanted to improve in terms of your relationship. So you're here. You were motivated to come to see if you could learn something that would help you improve your relationship so that you would live in a better real world. We behave in an attempt to get the real world to match up with our quality world. And I think that's, it's great. It's, uh, I use the example of the lawn. I have, I, I have some neighbors that I know they have a really very specific quality picture of what their lawn looks like because about every other day they're out mowing their yard. And it's a beautiful lawn and that's really important to them. That's a priority for them. And I don't have quite that level. I do like to have a nice lawn, and I do work at it, but maybe it's every two weeks instead of every two days. It depends on what your priority is and how much you want to work on any one picture in terms of getting your need met uh, for that particular thing. So this is just that part of the, of the diagram that when the pictures match up, there's a sense of control. And you feel, you feel like it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. There are some pictures that are just kind of neutral. You're driving here and there's cars go by and you don't have any feeling one way or another because they don't have anything to do with your need. You just don't want them to drive in front of you and crash your car. But in general, they, they're neutral. Then there are negative things that interfere with our ability to create the quality world in our life. And so that's how stress is generated when, when these things don't match up. So anytime you're feeling stress, you can ask yourself, what need is it that I'm not getting satisfied in this moment? And how is, what can I do now to, to, to more effectively uh, achieve better control? So let's see here. So these are just what I was talking about. So the gap, the gap between what you want and what you perceive yourself to be getting, that's stress. And it can be an illness. You know, you, we want our, our images ourselves being healthy and having energy and getting things done. And then if we're sick and you've got a sneezy nose and you're tired and you're achy and you can't get out of bed, that's a big gap. And so, that, so your, what is your behavior? You might call the doctor. You might uh, take some medicine, you know, uh, take extra vitamin C, something like that. You're going to behave in order to control your perception of how you are in the real world so it matches up how you want to be. <clears throat> so here's, this, is, this is a very interesting part. What happens when conflict arises? as it inevitably does. Conflict arises when two irreconcilable pictures live in our quality world. And I, this, is, this is an interesting little thing that, that uh, Dr. Glasser came up with. Uh, very, a, good, a very common example is conflict in a marriage. Let's say in this example you are the woman, you're living in a marriage where you don't get enough love and attention from your husband. But your husband is a good provider and a good father to your children, but you're starved for love. So you have the love and belonging, but you need the survival. 
You have two basic needs here kind of in conflict. So true conflict in a marriage. No behavior exactly will resolve this conflict. If you leave the husband, now you've lost the, the survival, the, the support. Or uh, if you just try to, you know, just, uh, if, and if you try to have an affair to get the love and belonging, well, then you're, you're, you're threatening the marriage. You can't leave and you can't stay at the same time, though sometimes we try to balance these kinds of things as best we can. You cannot resolve these contradictory pictures. This is when people become depressed. This is when you know, there's, a, there's a, a tendency to choose misery. You just feel terrible. And, and Glasser likes to use the verb t- term for depression. He, doesn't, he thinks a lot of people, it's not a, a noun state, it's a verb. It's something you do when you're in a true conflict. You choose a misery state in hopes that maybe the other person will change. It's a kind of external control psychology. You may live in subdued or outright anger, or you may choose the quiet desperation of chronic depression or marital martyrdom. Unfortunately, these behaviors do not really work. Nor does Prozac, I mean, you can feel better, or you can numb down with a medicine. It's putting, I say it's like putting antibiotic ointment on the splinter wound where the splinter went in, but you haven't taken the splinter out yet, and so it still stays inflamed. So this is where he comes in. This is, this is probably the most interesting part of his, of his system, is what he calls the creative system. Very often we are confronted with uh, true conflict. And he says there's, there is a system, there's a part of our brain that's always looking for answers uh, when we get in these double binds. When we are faced with true conflict, we need to access our creative system to find new ways to satisfy the pictures in our quality world. Uh, if you, the, he, wrote, he and his wife wrote a really good book called Getting Together and Staying Together. And it's about uh, married couples who are having problems. And really, the book is about the creative system, how you, you need to become creative in order to deal with that instead of just choosing misery. So we choose to behave in a way, behave as a way of modifying and controlling our perceptions so that our pictures do get satisfied. So it's, the creative system is a kind of built-in stress management system, but you have to be willing to access it. So the miserable wife is caught in true conflict. Her quality world picture of true love is not being satisfied in the real world of her marriage. She is choosing misery and depression. If she would tap into her creative system, what else could she choose to do? Well, this is where the seven caring habits come in. You know, these these are always available, and and it's amazing how if people would just try these more often, and, and just say, hey, let's have a talk, or let's go for a coffee, or let's, let's go for a walk. Uh, what's, what's on your mind? What's going on? You know, and just have the respect to listen and not try to fix. I, I learned that from my wife. Listen, don't fix me. You know? And I, so often men get into that problem where we, we, where we want to we fix. And oftentimes it's just a matter of listening and kind of getting both sides speaking. And it's amazing what can be accomplished with these seven habits. So just kind of, if you take anything home from the presentation today, try these because they really do work, but you, it's kind of like, what's that saying? In order for them to work, you have to work them. Behaviors that cultivate healthy relationships. So uh, now Glasser goes into a whole thing that he calls total behavior. I won't have time to go into this into detail, but total behavior is, he says, choice is not just an intellectual thought. It, it also involves how you feel, what's going on with your physiology, you know, because if you're stressed, very often your heart's beating, your hands are cold, you're, you, know, you're having, you might have digestive problems. So a total behavior en- encompasses all four of these areas. But the two you have the most control over is thinking and behaving. So he, he says that all we as human beings can do is behave. And he, he feels, and this is really, it's an empowering uh, belief or, or a, a attitude, I guess you'd say, if you, if you believe that all behavior is chosen, not to say that everything that happens to you is chosen, but if you just say, I'm going to be responsible for my behavior, then you can start focusing your behavior on satisfying basic human needs, either in yourself or in your significant other, whoever the other person is in the relationship. So the most important need is love and belonging since closeness and connectedness is a prerequisite to satisfying all the basic needs. Uh, behavior is generated when there is a difference between what, you, what we want and what we perceive ourselves to be getting in the real world, and this is our definition of stress. 
you cannot ignore stress. That's the interesting thing. You must choose to do something, and that's his point is that depression or uh, misery is oftentimes we choose that because we don't, we don't know of anything else to do or we aren't, we aren't willing to tap into that creative system or we've tried and we feel like we've failed. But that's the whole thing about creativity is that you, it's the idea of finding new ways to deal with uh, situations that seem insolvable. So you choose your actions and your thoughts directly. Actions and thoughts give rise to feelings and physiology indirectly. So most people, you know, you can't, you know, if you feel a certain way, oftentimes you can't stop how you feel. If your heart is racing and you're having an anxiety attack, you cannot make your heart stop. Now you can take a medicine, you can take a, a beta blocker and slow it down. But what he's saying is look at your actions and your thoughts and start working with those. So to change how you feel and to change your physiology, focus on changing your actions and your thoughts. And that is the practical aspect of his choice theory, which is reality therapy. If something's not working, make a new plan. That's the, in essence, what reality therapy is. <clears throat> so I use the car analogy. The idea here being is that uh, you are the driver making steering choices and you choose your actions and your thoughts. You have, you have some jurisdiction in that area. And then where you steer the car, it's the physiology and the feelings that in the, at least in the old cars, the differential would make those wheels go around. That's what drives your life. That's what gives power and motion to, to your life. But you have to steer with your actions and your thoughts. So the 10 uh, axioms of control theory, this is, gets just, just to kind of summarize uh, what we've been talking about today. The only person whose behavior we can control is our own. All we can give to another person is information. Hopefully it's the kind of information that helps him satisfy basic needs. All long-lasting psychological problems are, are relationship problems, according to Glasser. The problem relationship is always part of our present life. So in other words, if you had a problem in the past and you're, you're having problems now, it could be, it could be there in the, in the past, but you have to solve it in the present. What is happening in the past have, has everything to do with what we are today but we can only satisfy our basic needs right now and plan to continue satisfying them in the future. We satisfy our needs by satisfying the pictures in our quality world. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to start reflecting on what is it that really gives me happiness or, or you know, belonging, whatever. And so what am I doing to kind of help facilitate bringing that out in my life right now? All we do is behave. All behavior is total behavior and is made up of the four components of acting, thinking, feeling, and physiology. All total behavior is chosen, but we have direct control over acting and thinking. We have indirect control of our feelings and physiology through how we choose to act and think. All total behavior is designated by verbs and named by the part that is most recognizable. That's why he, he, he uses the word depression depressing. A person is not in depression, they are actively depressing either as a way of uh, preventing them from acting out anger or from trying to get someone else to recognize that they're not, that they're not happy. Uh, it's, it's trying to get someone to change. It's a kind of uh, external control psychology. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, healthy relationships are good for your health uh, because of this total behavior thing. If you're involved in actively uh, working to satisfy your basic needs, more than likely you are, you are genetically fulfilling yourself and you will tend to feel better, function better, uh, thrive more, just like the, you know, fle feeding the plant. It'll, it will thrive. Choice theory teaches us how to cultivate healthy relationships by working on connectedness. And you know, connectedness is an interesting, it's almost like, I, I've thought about connectedness as being kind of like a spirituality. That, uh, you know, that, that connectedness is that invisible part that you want to work on. And when you have it, there's a kind of a spirit in the relationship that you can't see, but yet it's, a, it's an energy and it creates a kind of dy dynamism that things get done. And so if you have healthy relationships, you can tend to get your needs met and things grow and life is moving right along. But if you have a, a relationship that gets blocked up through the... Uh, through the seven deadly habits, uh, then it's amazing how life just kind of stops and things start getting stuck and everything starts 
malfunctioning. And so definitely health is a kind of flow. And if you want to keep things flowing, work on being connected. The seven caring habits are much more effective at building quality relationships than the destructive seven deadly habits. The seven deadly habits will get short-term results. The seven caring habits will get long-term results. So unfortunately, 99% of the world uses external control psychology to try and meet their basic needs in their important relationships. So hopefully you'll walk away today challenging that idea that maybe that's not the best way to live your life. That, they're, that if you're having some problem relationships, try some different things. Use your creative system to try some different things. External control psychology is ineffective and is the source of much of the misery we experience in our lives and probably ill health, kind of like that, you know, the heart attacks in men that are in an unloving relationship. Try choice theory to build more need-satisfying relationships, the basis of greater happiness and effectiveness in your life. So uh, these are the f four things that I want you to kind of remember that that the basics of choice theory is the only person I can really control is myself. Kind of ask yourself, what can I do to improve, not, not wait for the other person, but what can I do to improve my relationships? The other person almost always changes when I stop trying to externally control them. And what can I do to help my whoever significant person uh, satisfy his or her basic needs? So it's, that's an action, that's a thought, that's an attitude that can help you work on your relationships without waiting for them to change. You are the one that's going to change and that's how you take control. You're making a choice that's going to help you be uh, happier. Now I do, I want to show you, I, I, I fortunately know someone who I think is a relationship guru, who's got it all figured out, who uh, is very good at all of these seven things, listening, supporting, encouraging, just phenomenal. I just don't know of anyone quite like this person and uh, never, never criticizes, never blames, never complains, never nags. Well, nags a little bit now and then, but never threatening or punishing or bribing. But this, this, I, w I was going to, I was going to have her come today just so we could share a little bit, but she really couldn't make it. So I'm just going to show her, show you her, my, my picture. <laughs> this is my relationship guru. She's got it all figured out. She's got it all figured out. She's just a total friend. You talk about friends. She's a friend. She's always willing to come sit on your lap. She wants to spend time with you. She's, she'll bring her little toy over. Let's play. Let's have some fun. I'm always the fuddy-duddy the, of the two of us. Uh, she never criticizes me. You know, she's always glad to see me. And when I walk in, I, things perk up. I feel better. I, I think she is good for my health. Now, the only bad thing was, is that my wife, was, she got this wife for, or my wife got this little dog for herself, and there's some envy there, because we've kind of, we've become really special friends, and so, anyway, if you want to, uh, it's really true, though, I think this thing about man's best friend, uh, it's really true that dogs have some kind of something to where they know how to do relationships really well. Now, there are dysfunctional dogs out there, but a lot of that, there are... I, I'm wondering how much of that is the dysfunctional owner <laughs> trying to ex do external control. Um, but anyway, this, it's, kind of, it was been, it's been kind of fun. We've had her for about two and a half years, and I really feel like I have learned a lot about this, this lecture, uh, kind of w how they are. They're just naturally friendly. S the smart bird does not poop in its own nest. So uh, thank you very much.